Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, RSK Biosensors First Thursday Club webinar. I'm Des Delahay, I'm a director here at RSK Biosensors and it's my pleasure to host today's presentation. Our speaker today is Ben Faulkner, he's a senior aquatic ecologist at RSK Biosensors and as his title suggests he deals mostly in aquatic ecology, particularly in fisheries, but he also works on uh, wider issues such as managing impacts on riparian mammals. He's a full member of the Institute of Fisheries Management and has undertaken many, many fish rescues across the UK. And it's fish rescues that he's going to talk to us about today. But just before we start, a couple of housekeeping announcements to get through. Um, first of all, your mics will be turned off throughout this presentation, but that's not uh, because we don't want to hear from you. We certainly do. So if you have any questions, then pop them in the chat. There'll be a Q&A session uh, after the presentation finishes, and we'll try to rattle through as, as many of those as possible. Any that we don't get through during the Q&A session, uh, I'm sure Ben will be happy to provide uh, uh, email answers to. Also, shortly after the presentation, you'll be sent a link um, where you're able to provide some feedback on these webinars. If you could take a couple of minutes to fill it out, we'd be very grateful. Uh, it will help us uh, uh, to make sure these uh, uh, these webinars, this program of webinars, does what uh, what we hope it does and um, keeps you well informed. So, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ben, um, who's going to talk to you about fish rescues. Off you go, Ben. Thanks, Des, for that introduction, and um, yeah, welcome everyone today. He's he's joined for this this lunchtime webinar. So as Des mentioned, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about fish rescues. Um, before we dive into the talk, though, I'm just going to quickly run through today's today's agenda. So first things first, we're just going to have a quick quick introduction. For those of you who may not be too familiar with what a fish rescue is, just to briefly introduce that process. We're then going to move on and have a very, very quick look at some of the key legislation um, which is involved with fish rescues. This isn't going to cover everything, but just the main points to consider. We're then going to cover certain scenarios where fish rescues may become applicable. So we're going to start off with some fairly obvious examples, then move on to the slightly more obscure examples that potentially go overlooked. Moving on after that, we're then going to go a little bit more into the processes involved. So the actual methods we're going to be undertaking and site and the, and the planning and preparation side of things. I then thought it'd be quite useful if we, we just had a slide um, to cover the commonly cat pitfalls. So these are these are mistakes that I've, I've made in the past and, and hopefully by doing so, that will be useful for you people out there who go ahead and do these kind of jobs. And lastly, we're gonna end on some, some case studies. So just some real life examples of jobs that we've completed um, recently. So I'm just gonna pop my camera off now and we'll, we'll go into the main talk. Right, so let's begin with a quick introduction just for the benefit of anyone who's listening who might not know what a fish rescue is or why we might need one. So what is a fish rescue? So it's essentially a means of preventing injury or harm to fish where they are potentially at risk. And this is applicable to a variety of different scenarios. I'm going to be covering a few of them during this talk. Generally, what happens in the process, we, we capture those fish, we temporarily retain them while they recover, and then we relocate them to a place of safety, so somewhere that's out of harm way. Typically, we complete a fish keep risk rescue prior to works commencing on site, but there are occasions where we need to have that ongoing presence on site. And um, I've actually got one of those examples to share with you in the case study section. So we use a variety of methods to capture the fish. Um, and yeah, we're going to go into some detail on those later on. Um, but yeah, broadly split into two categories, electric fishing and netting methods. So fish rescues can be applicable to all different aquatic environments, and that's important to consider. So mainly fresh water, but we often get into tidal, tidal jobs and very occasionally some work in marine environments. So things like um, marine docks, um, anywhere, anywhere close to the, to the sea. And really, really importantly, Fish rescues should be reviewed as the last resort to, to mitigate impacts to fish. There are other means that we can implement to remove those impacts. So, so let's think of them as a, as a last resort and, and uh, 
think of other solutions where possible. And I just thought I'd, I'd end this introduction slide on, on quite a, an important point, and that's just, just to not neglect fish as a, a potential constraint. So obviously, in terms of ecology, the spotlight is, is very much on other, on other groups, um, bats, badgers, great crested newts, that kind of thing. But, but fish are equally as important, and if you do end up neglecting them, it could potentially cause a delay to your project. So it's important that they are considered. So right, let's get the slightly dry stuff out of the way and talk a little bit about legislation. Um, so this section isn't going to cover all the legislation out there, which might be relevant to fish, as that would probably need um, its own separate webinar or maybe multiple talks. So this is just a brief overview of a couple of bits of legislation which are probably most relevant to fish rescues. Um, so the first one I've thrown up is the Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Act. Um, and I've picked out a few key considerations under this legislation um, which are relevant to fish rescues and, and just generally working in environments near or in water where fish could be um, impacted. Um, so the first one I've got is potentially committing an offence if we knowingly take kill, injure, or attempt to take, kill, or injure any salmon, trout, lamprey, smelt, shad, freshwater fish, or specified fish in any waters which is unclean. So that's a fish that's either spawning or in preparation for spawning or immature. So taking this point into consideration, if we're working in an area where there's, there's likely to be fish present, and, and that could be salmon, trout, it could be carp, or even those tiny minor species, so stickleback or bullhead, and they could be impacted by those works, we may be committing an offence if we don't introduce any mitigation to remove those impacts. Moving on, it's also an offence to cause um, disturbance to spawn, spawning fish or spawning areas. So we need to be mindful of timing work sensitively to avoid spawning periods, uh, and that's going to be dictated by what species we're likely to encounter. And then just the last, a last little point there under section section four. So that that makes it an offence to to cause any, in effect, any pollution to to a watercourse, which could um, be detrimental to fish or spawning areas. So so we need to be mindful of things like silt there, uh, and that just links, I guess, back to best practice really, and making sure when we when we work in near near watercourses that uh, pollution measures are um, sufficiently robust. So as ecologists, we also need to be mindful of the equipment we, we use to catch the fish is licensable. So the electrofishing equipment and the net, met, netting methods we use. Um, we can't just go out and use these willy-nilly. We need to imply for consent to use those. And that consent is um, site-specific. And um, we're going to touch a little bit more on that in the later sections of this report. And the second piece of legislation I've included um, in these slides is the Keeping and Introduction of Fish Regulations 2015. And this essentially regulates the movement and introduction of fish to inland waters. Um, so basically, as part of this legislation, we just need, need to be mindful that we have the appropriate consents and permits in place um, to move fish and to, to introduce them into the new water body, if that's a necessary part of our fish rescue. So appreciate that was a fairly brief overview of legislation, um, but let's move on and let's think about some example scenarios where fish rescues might be required. Um, and as I touched on earlier, I'm going to start with the slightly more obvious examples and move over to those more obscure situations where uh, we're potentially um, overlooking those the fish. First things first, anywhere where we've got a uh, permanent loss of a water body. So it could be we've got a reservoir which is be, being decommissioned. Um, we might potentially have um, a lake or a pond um, on a hazard development site that's going to be lost or infilled. And it might be that we've actually got an artificial water body which is which has been lost where fish have become accidentally introduced. So we occasionally got called called out to jobs on, for example, water treatment works or, or power stations, anywhere where they've got settlement tanks or, or areas where, where water's held. Um, so it's important we don't neglect these. And generally speaking, with this kind of fish rescue, they are they do tend to be the most, most challenging we encounter. And that's because you usually end up dealing with significant numbers of fish and you have that added added pressure of finding somewhere suitable to, to rehome them. So that, yeah generally form the more, more tricky end of the scale. 
moving on, we also need to consider anywhere where we're required to um, to temporary do water. Um, this is generally speaking anywhere that's connected to um, connected to a surface water body. So if you've got some some standing water in a in a field, obviously this doesn't really become applicable. But anywhere where there's likely to be fish present, so it could be a situation where we have a canal lock, for example, such as the image shown here. And we need to drain the water within there to to carry out some some maintenance works. Um, another example, perhaps, is if we've got some debris or silt in channel, and we need to dewater an area to be able to get in stream and remove that those obstructions. And similarly, we might just need to dewater uh, an area to carry out some inspections. So, such as in the case of a, a water supply reservoir. Moving on, we've also got sort of small scale. Um, dewatering that needs to be considered. So basically anywhere where we need to create a dry working area adjacent to a water course or water body. And this is usually done using what's called a, a coffer dam structure. So if you, if you look at the image to the right there, this has been achieved using large sandbags, but it can also be done with things like sheet piling as well. Um, so we're effectively creating a segregated area adjacent to um, a water course or water body, which is then dewatered to give um, a dry working area. And this can be used in a variety of situations. So in this example here, we've got some repair works going on on, on that section of wall. Um, but we could be working on some bridge footings, for example, um, or there might be a structure there that's actually been, been introduced. So um, an outfall or, or something similar to that. But yeah, very important that we don't neglect these situations. Appreciate that we're dealing with much smaller areas, but that doesn't mean fish aren't present. And, uh, just using the example I've shown in that image there, that, that relatively small area there, probably five square meters at most. Um, I think we caught over 40 bullhead from that from that site. And those range from tiny little juvenile fish all the way up to, to four adults. So certainly worthwhile that we, we went in and, and recommended that mitigation. Moving on to watercourse crossings, um, sorry, watercourse diversions. So anywhere where <clears throat> we have an existing watercourse um that needs to be realigned realigned for whatever reason and that could be potentially we've got a, a river that's that's tracking close to a railway or road and there's concerns that there could be erosion there we might need to send it on a different course um it could be to facilitate construction works so it might be that we've we've got a structure going in um such as the the bridge structure you can see in that picture there and potentially we just need to slightly amend the the alignment of the channel to accommodate that feature. Um, and we also need to include projects which involve major river restorations, such as where um, maybe we've got a, a previously straightened channel and we're, we're going to be realigning that to its historic route. So if fish are potentially at risk during in that process, we might need to undertake a fish rescue. So let, let's think about those, those restoration jobs as well. Um, the same rules do apply to those. Moving on, um, again, even, even more obscure, um, watercourse crossings, uh, and these broadly fall into two categories. So crossings which involve the installation of services, so things like electrical cables, um, water pipeline routes, gas pipelines, anywhere where we need to actually dig into the bed and the banks of the channel, install their services. And similarly, we might need to install a structure within the channel to facilitate a crossing. So um, to allow vehicle access, for example, and I've, I've put up a little example of that there in that photo. So that's just a small pipe culvert and a, and a sandbag crossing. Um, but yeah, in that situation, we did a fish rescue prior to that going in and then immediately before it was removed, we completed another one. Last but not least, I've got emergency fish rescue. So not necessarily linked to a scenario at all, but you know, in, in the odd circumstance, we may have a pollution incident or something of that nature, but these, these tend to crop up more when you've got um, uh, poor weather. So, well, not poor weather from our perspective, but um, prolonged hot weather, uh, minimal rainfall, leading to things like low river levels, falling water tables and, and poor water quality. And, Generally, due to the nature of these jobs, they're, they're fairly reactive, taking a short notice. 
So before I move on to the next section, I thought I'd throw up um, quite an important question. And that, and that question is, do we need to do a fish rescue at all? Um, so just taking some of the examples we've just looked at, um, is there anything we can do to potentially need the, remove the need for a fish rescue entirely? Things we need to be looking at here are things like scheme designs. Um, is the ways in which we can tweak the design potentially to remove that impact? We've got, for example, a bridge structure going in channel. Can we ensure that's an open span structure um, so that we don't impact that water course? It might be that we can we can look at amending the construction methods. So if we're, for example, cutting into the banks and the bed of a water course, it may be that there's a possibility we can actually drill beneath it and, and again, remove that impact to, to fit. And it's very important we ask those questions. And the reason for that is at, at the best of times, fish rec rescues are potentially quite stressful to fish. And, and that's even if we do everything we can in terms of following best practice and ensuring that our fish husbandry is, is really tip top. So if we can avoid them entirely, we take, take that stress completely out of the picture. And there's also a risk that if we are moving fish, particularly from one water body to another, that we could be spreading parasites and disease. And again, if we don't have to do the fish rescue in the first place, we can alleviate that risk. And yeah, so let's let's think of these fish rescues as a last resort, really. Let's exhaust those other opportunities first. All right, so now that we've covered some example scenarios, let's assume we have asked those questions. We've exhausted all opportunities of removing plat for the fish, and therefore our best option to mitigate those impacts is to, to undertake a fish rescue and move those fish out of harm's way. So what are the processes that are involved with that? So with any piece of work we undertake, there's always going to be um, an initial assessment where we have to, to collect some information and ask ourselves some questions. Um, so we need to think about what kind of works have been undertaken and importantly when. So we need to make sure those, those works don't conflict with sensitive periods of the year, such as such as spawning times. We need to think about what equipment we might be needed. So we're we going to need nets, are we going to need electrofishing, or are we going to need a combination of the two? It's something we need to consider. And very importantly, where will these fish be relocated? So it's very important that this is established early on in the process. It's no good us getting to site uh, and working that out when we're there. <clears throat> so this, this initial assessment stage, it can be very quick, you know, 20 minute job. We could just be sitting at a desk, looking at a few photographs we've been sent, um, potentially some aerial imagery, um, or some existing fish data that we've, we've got. However, in more, more complex scenarios, it might be that we actually have to physically get on site ourselves and conduct a thorough site visit. Um, and that's particularly useful where we we concern we might have restrictions to access. Um, or just where we want to have a, a better look and, and, and work out how we're going to approach the fish rescue. In situations where we're moving fish from, from one water body to another, so if we've, we've got a permanent loss of a water body, it's likely that we're going to need to do a very detailed stock assessment as well. And that will involve going to the site and doing a survey using a variety of methods just to work out numbers of fish present and the likely species that we're going to encounter. So once we've got the answers to those questions, we need to think about getting the relevant consents in, pro in place before we go out. And things we need to think about are the fishing instruments we're using and, and also the, the actual physical movement of fish themselves. And we need consent in place for both processes. So an England consent is obtained from the Envir Environment Agency's fish movements team. In Wales, this is covered by Natural Resources Wales, and in Scotland, up in Marine Scotland. Important to note, though, um, as part of the consenting process, if we are transferring fish from one water body to another, um, it's likely that a health check is going to be a stipulation um, detailed within that consent. And, and by that, I mean uh, a sample of fish is submitted to a laboratory and check for signs of disease and parasites. And that's just an additional control measure there to, to prevent that from occurring. Right, so let's move on to some of the methods we might use um, and what situations they're useful for and which ones there may not be. So starting off with seine netting. So seine netting, seine net is a large curtain net. We have floats on the top and a lead line on the bottom. This essentially creates a physical barrier to fish. 
and um, we'd set this out um, in a semicircular fashion, as you can see in that picture there. Um, generally more applicable to areas of wide open water uh, and fairly ineffective where we've got underwater obstructions um, such as fallen trees, uh, dense macrophy beds, that kind of thing really. Um, so yeah, generally more suited to lakes, canals as well to a certain extent and, and also slow flowing rivers. Um, but yeah, fairly adaptable so you can tailor your mesh size to the, the species you're anticipating to catch. If you're primarily dealing with smaller fish, you'd want to use a micro mesh net. But if it's mainly big carp and tench, that kind of thing, you might be able to increase that, that mesh size to make things a little easier for you. Moving on, we also have electrofishing. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar um, with what electrofishing is, it's essentially introducing a mild uh, electrical current into the water course or water body, which temporarily immobilizes the fish present, um, allowing them to be, to be captured. And there's various different different setups we can we can um, use our electric equipment fishing in, uh, and I've split the slides into those just to give you a little bit of a flavour of how adaptable this kit is. So the first setup I've got is is what's called a bank side setup. So in this situation, we'd have our power source and our controls on the bank side, and then we'll have um, leads travelling from the power source into the into the channel uh, and the surveyors are using these anodes, which are the, the grey rods you can see in the image to the right, to, to introduce the, the current to the, to the water course. This works well in both running water and still water environments, and importantly, you can use it in situations where you, you have obstructions present, so it, it can be used to, to draw fish out of the, that cover. Fairly adaptable as well, so we can we can introduce more or less less anodes where we're, we're dealing with larger or smaller working areas. So yeah, quite, quite a versatile bit of kit. We can also deploy electric fishing from a backpack setup. So this is um, in the photo to my right, my colleague Will there doing his best Ghostbusters impression. Um, this has a number of advantages. So firstly, there's no, no risk of pollution involved here. It's a, it's a battery powered piece of equipment. Um, it's also quite useful in tight working spaces. So where we've got densely dense bank side cover um, uh, or a narrow narrow water course, such as in this situation here. Um, but yeah, in that situation, we're actually limited to one anode, so it's only really used in smaller working areas. And we can also um, we can also set our electrofishing equipment up in a boat, um, and that can be as as you you see our surveyors there, um, actually a float on the water, or we can actually have the equipment set up in the boat. And then ourselves walking in front, wading, trailing the boat, and that's just a little bit of a, a neater way of um, containing the equipment. Um, but yeah, generally relies on, on fairly open water to be able to do this, and um, yeah, fairly challenging to operate. Um, but yeah, a useful technique to have in your bag, and it does come in to play on occasions. And the last technique I'm going to show you for today is bike netting. So not something we typically use um, during a main fishery rescue itself, but it's very useful in that initial sort of survey stage when you're looking to get an idea of species composition and rough numbers. Uh, and effectively, this is a this is a trap. So we'd set this um, for a period of up to 24 hours, and it's arranged in that setup as you can see in the picture to the right. So that's how it would look on the bottom of the bottom of the lake or river. You've got uh, two traps joined together there. Um, and there's a curtain of net in between them. So the theory being the fish hit the curtain and then head out the right or left and end up in, in, end up in one of the traps. Um, and yeah, it's important to know that when you are using that piece of kit, you need to fit a, what's called an otter guard and that goes on the aperture of the net and, and just um, prevents any risk of otters um, accidentally getting in the traps. So once we've, um, <clears throat> we've gone ahead and captured our fish, we're going to be temporarily retaining them for a, for a period of time just to let them slightly recover from the ordeal of being captured and during this process it's going to allow us to to get an appreciation of numbers and species composition uh, and during this process fish welfare is really paramount um, and we need to think about minimizing retention time where possible in terms of holding containers we need to tailor these to the to the species and numbers of fish we're likely to encounter so if we've, we're just anticipating a few hundred smaller sticklebacks or roach, that kind of thing, we might be able to get away with large buckets just on the bank side. Um, but if we're dealing with much bigger 
fish like carp, tench, pike, that kind of thing. We want proper bespoke kit um, with with secure lids so we can we can safely keep those those fish temporarily. It's important that we introduce aeration when we're retaining the fish. Um, that just helps reduce reduce the stress levels, um, particularly during the warmer summer months. Um, and just an important tip, just to maybe when you you undertaking these jobs, just to have a water quality parameter probe with you. Uh, and that way you can you can monitor key parameters like temperature and dissolved oxygen and just, just make sure that they're they're suitable for the fish um, while you're doing the fish rescue. And, and if they are unsuitable, you can you can do things like um, split fish out into other buckets and undertake water changes, that kind of thing. And then we need to think about rehoming these fish. So that receptor lo location, as I touched on earlier, should have been established right at the beginning of this process. Um, the habitat for the receptor location should be comparable to the capture location. So if we've caught the fish from a shallow, fast flowing section of river, for example, we want to try and find some habitat that's, um, that closely replicates this. Um, but that being said, we want to make sure that the relocation site is as close to as possible as the site they were captured. And that's just from a uh, minimising retention perspective. So th those two are a little bit of a balancing act. Um, but yeah. and then we also need to think about um, transport containers. So making sure these are fit for purpose. If we're just dealing with a small water course crossing, for example, it might be that we're moving the fish just 50, 100 metres. In that situation, you know, things like hand buckets are going to be absolutely fine. But if we're moving fish from one lake to another, uh, and there are large numbers of fish, we're going to need proper holding tanks that are uh, attached to a four by four um, with adequate space to be able to take the fish we've um, captured. Right, moving on, um, hopefully you'll find these next couple of slides quite useful. It's just fish, um, just fish, just things I've uh, picked up over the years of doing these jobs. Um, and yeah, little mistakes that I've made and, and learned from, but yeah, hopefully by doing so, it'll, I mean, you don't make the same mistakes I do. So first thing I've put up is site conditions not as expected. Um, so this, this ties in really with that initial assessment stage. This has occurred where we, we've not gathered enough information during that stage and it could be a number of things. So it could be that we get to site and there's dense vegetation everywhere um, and we can't actually get to the channel. It might be there's really steep banks and there's no safe access and it could be just we've just bought the wrong equipment. Um, so yeah, really really get the information during that stage. And if and if you do need to take a site visit, if you're not if you're not confident, just really push that, push that point, um, and get to site and see things with your own eyes. Um, we also need to consider additional ecological constraints. So don't necessarily assume these these assessments have been done done prior to. Make sure you ask those questions because um, there are other things that are, are applicable. Thinking things like nesting birds, Potentially GCN if we're if we're dealing with ponds, um, and a big one is invasive non-native species. So we um, we frequently um, see sites with invasive plant species and um, things like signal crayfish. So it's just making sure um, there's adequate mitigation in for those for those other other things. Well, before we we go ahead and do our fish rescues, um, quite a, probably quite an obvious one. Just just um allowing sufficient time to be able to to get the planning stages and consent in place and it's just being up front and open with whoever you're working with um on the, on the jobs you know just be transparent you know these these consents do can take up to several weeks to come through um so it's just just you know relaying those time expectations weather and river levels obviously scupper things quite frequently um, there's plenty of good weather apps there so it's it's not hard to keep track of the weather and likewise with uh, river level stations so they're fairly widespread across the country appreciate all sites might not have a gauging station nearby but there, there is things you can do so you might be able to extrapolate from a nearby site or there might be someone who's working in in close proximity to to your to your water course or water body and they might be able to pop their head in and just take a look. There's, there's always a way around, around these things. Um, so yeah, it'd be, be really not to talk about equipment. Um, so equipment failure, make, make sure you've got spares of everything. Um, 
that way if something does break um, a disaster turns into a minor inconvenience whereby you just have to swap kit out and just having the right equipment for the job really so if you're not sure whether you might need a might need a sane net bring one and, and importantly make sure it's on your consent there's nothing worse than getting to site and thinking oh god i wish i had that sane net um yeah prepare for all those eventualities and yeah more importantly make sure they're on your consent when you uh, initially apply and the last one is probably probably one of the most important points i think is is um planning in some contingency time um, so these jobs frequently overrun uh, for a variety of reasons and by having an extra couple of days planned in um, that can um, yeah help you out so moving on to the the last part of the talk i'm just going to go through a few case studies um, these cover a variety of different situations and a variety of different water bodies and, and hopefully it just gives you a sort of the flavour of the different situations um, we come across and puts into practice some of those things I've discussed earlier in the talk. Right, so the first case study I've got today was actually, um, it turned out to be an emergency fish rescue in relation to um, temporary dewatering of a small pond, um, or you could probably class it as a lake really. Um, so important to note in this situation, so that an initial assessment wasn't was carried out identifying the presence of fish, but unfortunately no action was taken on this. So there was a range of other surveys done and mitigation in, in relation to other ecology, but but fish were slightly overlooked in this in this instance. Um, uh, and when pumping began on site, it was became fairly obvious fairly soon that, that there were fish present. So we were we were contacted in to do a, a fish rescue at fairly short notice. Uh, luckily, in this situation, there was an adjacent pond which had um, green joining it, uh, and that meant that we um, were able to simply relocate those fish from one pond to another. Uh, and the reason we were we were allowed to do that in that situation is due to that hydrological connectivity, the risk of any disease spread uh, is considered minimal. The theory being, if it's present in one pond, it's probably already going to be present in the other. So yeah, that was planned at fairly short notice. Um, there were some minor delays on site just to get those consents in place um, uh, at fairly fairly last minute. Um, but just just to run through some of the techniques, so we had areas of open water, as you can see in that picture there, and areas of snags, uh, overhanging trees. So we're using a, a combined approach of sane netting and electro fishing. So sane netting is open water areas and then using the electro fishing uh, under the cover. So a good example there of a, of a combined approach really. But yeah, thankfully in that job, it was only, only a minor delay, but, but things yeah could obviously have been a hell of a lot worse. So moving across to the second case study, this is an, ex an example of a, a water course diversion. Uh, and this was completed on a canal feeder. So this is a, an artificial water course that was that's used to to regulate the the water level in in the canals. Um, so yeah, it's an artificial water body. There are fish present, so it it, it you know, follows the same rules. So in this situation, we undertook a site visit, and we quickly established that the bankside vegetation was going to be a significant constraint. Um, so this was cleared under ecological supervision given us perfect access to both banks. Other things we encountered on site, so we had a lot of floating duckweed, we had a lot of submerged macrophyte. So the first day of the fish rescue, we, we literally spent the whole day just, just cleaning out the channel, basically. It was it was pretty hard work, but by doing so, we, we in effect removed any in-stream cover for the fish to hide in, and it made the actual fish capturing process much easier. Other things we had to contend with, so, the water was very, very shallow, which meant we couldn't use a boat. And the deep silt, so we had probably half a metre of silt, meant that we couldn't wade up the channel. Um, so we decided to use electric fishing and introduce from the bank side. So you can see the two, two surveyors there fishing in tandem. So once we'd done um, some initial sweeps of the impacted section of water course, um, that section was dammed using sandbags, which you can see here. And then pump out apparatus was used to to over pump and maintain that continuity of flow. We then introduced another pump between the two dams, 
to dewater that impacted section of channel which was going to be in build um, and we remain on site while that happened um, but yeah one of those jobs that overrun sadly uh, we had issues with the pumps on site um, but we did have some contingency planned in so that wasn't an issue um, and during the job we moved over a thousand fish so mainly small sticklebacks um, three spine and nine spine but we did have some 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 larger species and these were relocated um, just a short distance upstream of the working area. So moving on to the third case study. So <clears throat> this is slightly out of the ordinary, um, not typically a standard job we, we tend to do, um, <clears throat> but effectively what's happening in this situation, we had a, a small, small water course, which is draining into the, the Humber estuary um, through a culvert, which had become clogged with uh, a lot of sand and silt and the contracts we were working for their job was essentially to remove that that's that blockage um, as part of this process there was some dewatering involved uh, and that's where we were um, commissioned to do our fish rescue so yeah generally quite again quite a challenging site lots of um, thick sticky mud um, which meant wading was pretty difficult um, with it being so close to the um, <clears throat> In Stardley area, the conductivity of the wall was extremely high, and that meant that our electro fishing equipment couldn't be used. So we had to adopt a netting approach with that one. So say nets, stop nets, and hand nets. Um, and the other thing we had to contend with was the tides. So <clears throat> there was only a very small working window on, on the ebb tide. So during high tide, the area where we would lead our dewater in the fish rescue became inundated, and that obviously complications to it in itself um, with obviously more fish being brought in so i thought it'd be um rude to have a, a flat fish in the title of the talk and not have one in the the actual uh, webinar itself so here's a picture of one here sadly it's not a place it's a flounder but yeah very cute um so we caught a variety of species in, you know, including this flounder so stickleback a few gobies using a combined approach and insane netting. And this was one of those circumstances that I touched on earlier where we had that um, further supervision. So essentially at the start of each day, we had to do a mini fish rescue um, just to allow those works continued. And that went on for maybe a week or so. Um, but yeah, one where we really had to get our thinking caps on. Um, yeah, quite a, quite a nice little job that one. And last, last but not least, um, this is one I really like throwing out there, just because it's um, it's such a small water course, and the fact that it was initially ruled out for limited potential for fish. Um, so on this occasion, we had a client who wanted to put um, a culvert on this water course, and that was just to create um, a temporary haul road um, to move plant in and out of a site. Um, so yeah, we we took a look at this site. There was some suitable areas for fish. And, and more importantly, it was a good connectivity with a much larger watercourse um, shortly downstream. Um, and that watercourse was known to have a variety of different fish species. So based on this, we, um, we decided to recommend a precautionary fish rescue, um, which we did using um, backpack apparatus. Uh, and yeah, it's a really good job we did, to be honest, because in a very short section of channel, maybe 10 meters, uh, not 10 meters, 30, 40 meters or so, we captured 10 brine trout, and these weren't small fish either, so up to 20 meters in length. Um, and these were transferred just, just in hand buckets, it was only a short distance downstream and, and relocated outside the working areas. Um, but yeah, just a really good example of, um, of looks can be deceiving and, and don't necessarily rule out these, these water bodies based on size. And that's pretty much everything from me today. Um, so thank you all for, for tuning in and listening. Um, I've just thrown up some, some contact details there. Um, so that's for myself and our head of aquatic ecology, Pete Walker. Um, so if there is anything you wanna get in contact with um, following this talk, um, jot down our details. Um, and, and yeah, feel free to feel free to get in touch. Um, but yeah, I'm going to hand it back over to Des. And I think I don't think I've overrun too much. Hopefully, there's some some time for some 
some questions, but I'll, yeah, I'll leave that slide up there. But yeah, thank you for everyone. Great. Well, thanks very much, Ben. Uh, that was really, really interesting and speaking as a as a largely terrestrial ecologist, um, I think I learned quite a lot there. Um, so we ha we do have a bunch of questions uh, in the chat. Um, we've got about five minutes, so we'll rattle through a few of them. Uh, the first one comes from Thomas uh, Gralock. Apologies, Thomas, if I've mangled your name. He asks, uh, what is the largest reservoir you think it's feasible to do a fish rescue on? For example, could you do it on a large artificial lake on a river uh, in a case where a dam was being decommissioned? Um, so me, me personally, we've we've done some work on some some fairly large large reservoirs. Um, I'm not sure in terms of acreage how big they were, but they're they're fairly substantial. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. I think you just need. You know, the larger the reservoir, the more the more resource you'd need to be able to, to be able to do them. Um, obviously, with the size, it's it's trickier. You need to as you think about fish welfare and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think you just need to take each case individually, really, and just just the, yeah. I guess assess the feasibility of it um, based on that. But yeah, we've done some some fairly big big jobs over the years. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question is from uh, Richard Collinson. He asks. Who controls the licensing of fish removals in Northern Ireland? In Northern Ireland, that's a very good question. I don't actually have the answer to that one. Um, yeah, that's something we'll have to um, look in, into for you. Um, I've not personally done any work in in Northern Ireland. Um, as I say, mainly mainly in England. I've done a few in Wales and 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 the odd one um, in Scotland. Um, but I imagine it'll be, it'll probably be the um, the local fisheries board. Um, or, or someone of that nature that they'd need to, to get in contact with. And if they did so, they'd, they'd be able to point them in the right direction, I think. Okay, but uh, so so we'll we'll find out a definitive answer, Richard, and get that back to you by, yep. by email. Um, the next question uh, comes from Tom House, and he's asking, have you come across uh, invasive non-native species like zebra mussel, signal crayfish, for example, being a, an issue that constrains your ability to carry out a fish movement. So, for example, you've got nice, healthy fish that you want to move them, but there's a risk of moving zebra mussel and signal crayfish along with them. He adds, uh, this is an awkward question and apologises, <laughs> but says he has a couple of uh, <laughs> a couple of sites with that exact situation. I know. It's, it's, uh, first, just say hello to Tom. He's a former colleague. Um, yeah, we have come across um, sites with um, invasive non-native species which are present. Um, I think it depends on the situation. So some some areas we've we've used we're, we're effectively just fishing small sections of watercourses where where they're present um, and moving fish from one side of the site to the other. So it's not not really a risk as such of, of spreading those species as they're um, but where you've got um, things like reservoirs and it obviously becomes a little bit trickier and I think think um, things like signal crayfish they can actually get lodged in the in the gills of fish as well so physically checking the um, the water before you transfer the fish isn't isn't even good enough in those situations you need to uh, yeah a real close examination I guess of fish but I guess, I guess it's really just yeah take, taking it um, each, each situation as as it comes really but yeah it, it's a tricky one really especially when you've got things like like mussels because they can obviously um uh the juvenile mussels can actually uh, lodge in the in the gills of the fish and that's that's part of their reproductive cycle um but yeah we've not really got a definitive answer for that one yeah it's uh, no can be tricky but yeah we, we do come across invasive species a lot of the time and it's just it's just put about putting measures in place to I guess minimize the risk of spreading them so we might use um, different sets of kit, um, so different nets when we're taking fish out of one water body and popping them in another, and it, yes, undertaking physical checks where we can as well. Sure. And staying on the theme of uh, uh, non-native species, um, Sue Evans asks, uh, we have a lot of fish in fire water tanks on our site which need to be filled in. Some are non-native species like goldfish, koi, etc. What are the options for dealing with these? 
Um, so yeah, that's rightly um, so. In, in ornamental species, are, they're not they're not classed as, as non-natives. So typically, we wouldn't be introducing them to, um, or wouldn't be allowed to introduce them to a to a new water body. But there's there's always situations where where we can potentially rehome them. Um, I think my advice in that situation would potentially just just speak with your um, your local fisheries officer and they might be able to to help you out and uh, potentially suggest a course of action to, to deal with those um, more ornamental species but in terms of things like koi carp you've also also got those those added disease risks so they carry the koi herpes virus and things like that so yeah it, it is tricky when you've got got mixed populations but that would be yeah. my advice anyway. okay well there's still quite a few questions uh, in the chat which uh, we're not going to get round to uh, answering this time round, uh, I'm afraid. Um, we've just about run out of time, really. Um, so I think it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Ben for a thoroughly interesting talk. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, these things wouldn't be anything if it wasn't for the audience. Our next first Thursday Club uh, webinar will be on March the 7th, when Tom Mason will talk about the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure. So we hope to see many of you there. So goodbye, see you again.